Hey everybody, welcome to Condug. This is February 2021 Condug meeting. We got uh, Ed Charbonneau as our speaker today. So we're just going to hang out for a while here. Everybody get settled in. See, we already got some people in the chat there. Hello, Energy Man. And we'll get started here in a couple minutes. Just want to give people a chance to get in the room. And then we'll go through the intro slides. So just uh, while you're waiting, uh, you might want to check out some of these social media sites here. You can go to Twitter, Twitter and find Conduct there, C-O-N-D-G. Also, Conduct.org, which takes you right to the meetup site there at the bottom, which is much easier to type. Hey, there's Ed Charbonneau already in the channel, showing off his cool Twitch emotes, power glove. Make sure to give Ed Charbonneau a follow on Twitch. He's a great Twitch streamer, by the way, way better than me. Covers some great stuff all the time, so definitely want to give him a follow and a subscription as well. Uh, Facebook.com slash conduct. These are all places you should definitely go and check things out because, you know, some, some things are happening behind the scenes that uh, may change the way you participate in conduct. So you want to keep aware of those, and the best way to do that is to follow us on social media, on Twitter, and meet up and whatnot. Hey, Bleak Morn, what's going on? It has been a long time. Uh, yes, I, of course I know uh, it's Mark Noble because Bleak Morn is a anagram, I believe, of Mark Noble. A little, little trivia for you there that's still rattling around my brain for some reason. But thanks for joining. Appreciate it. Ed Strumman also, thank you for the host. Appreciate that. Um, why in parentheses? I'm not sure what that emoji is. Emoji is. But hey, uh, by the way, if you are joining us for the very first time, and maybe you never used Twitch before. Uh, if you want to get entered to win a prize, you're going to need to have a Twitch account. So we'll give you some time to create that account there. And basically all you have to do to get entered to win some fabulous prizes is just type a message into the chat. It'll go right into a database and we'll pick at random with a SQL query. Later on, after Ed's presentation, I will pick some winners. So if you're on the fence about getting a Twitch account going, that might be a good enough reason. Yeah, you did already enter. Anyone who's already chatted has already entered. Integer Man, I believe, is ineligible. Uh, Ed Charbonneau, uh, I don't know. We can, we can leave it up to him if he wants to win the prize. But yeah, Bleak Morn is already entered, and so is the Eagles fan, 005. Thanks for stopping in. I believe the Eagles fan 005 won last month. Integer man, yes, you're ineligible and you always wave. Uh, I believe you've actually come up uh, uh, at random a few times. <laughs> uh, Ed Charbonneau, no, it's a not a couch database. It's a couch base database. Very different. Very different things. Uh, and you can see uh, my automated... Bot there actually doing the correction as well. I forgot about that. Yes, because they are often confused with each other, CouchBase and CouchDB. So it's important to differentiate those. But we're not here to talk about CouchDB and CouchBase. We're here to talk about Blazor and machine learning and Cosmos DB. That's what Ed Sharpner will be speaking on today. So hey, everybody else, thank you for saying hello in the chat there. We got Sam, David, Big Green, Ty Quan Tyler. EQ Mac, Couchmost TV, <laughs> no, in a German, you're terrible. Uh, but hey, thanks everybody for stopping in. And it seems, so last month, I don't remember if you remember this detail or not, but I had some problem with my bot, wasn't storing chat messages for some reason. I didn't change anything, uh, seems to be working this time, so I don't know. I'm a fire in my blazer, wow, that's, a, that's an old time meme. We're going to start in about one minute here, and we'll go through the slides. How about that teaser trailer for Zack Snyder's Army of the Dead? Yes, the Eagles fan is very much into the Snyder cut, by the way, <laughs> if you follow the Eagles fan on Twitter. What is the bot written in? The bot is written in ASP.NET, C Sharp, Couchbase, and the, oh, what's the Twitch lib, I believe? Which I haven't updated probably in way too long. No, not bot framework. No, it is just a custom ASP.NET. 
with some SignalR, some Twitch API, Couchbase as a backend, all deployed to Azure, of course. Quick question, what's Blazor asking for a friend? I think it's some sort of like suit jacket type of thing. I don't know. We're gonna, we're gonna find out tonight. We're gonna find out what Blazor is. It's pretty awesome, I'll tell you that. I'm gonna, I know that much. All right, 6.05, it's time to kick off the slide deck, get this out of the way, so then we can start, uh, hand it over to Ed. So like I said, make sure to follow all these things on social media here, Twitter, conduct.org, sign up for the meetup, Facebook slash Conduct, check all that stuff out. All right, and you can also find us on YouTube. We don't have enough subscribers yet for a real URL. So there's the full URL, but there's also a nice handy little bit.ly down there at the bottom. You can go and find that. And if someone could paste that into the stream to make that, or the chat to make that more clickable, I'd appreciate that. Uh, if the Y is capitalized and that, otherwise it's Conduct YouTube, bit.ly slash Conduct YouTube. Please subscribe. Uh, we'll post, we post videos there after the presentation. Uh, when I, when I get around to it, maybe a few days, but uh, they'll make their way there eventually. You can check out Jeremy Clark's presentation from last month, for instance. Uh, Bleak Morin, I believe that is the incorrect URL. It needs to be a capital Y. I think it is case sensitive, but uh, thank you anyway. So please subscribe there. We need 100 subscribers, I think, to get a real URL, so I'd appreciate that. Uh, we've got some great raffle prizes today. We've got a JetBrains license, any JetBrains product. Uh, so uh, stick around for that. And we've also got some couch base swag. So today I've got actually some new swag to give away. This amazing couch base cooler backpack. So if you're going on a picnic or whatever, you can put some uh, drinks or whatever in there. And I will put some stickers and other miscellaneous stuff I can find, I can find in the couch base Columbus office prize closet. I'll throw it in there and, and I will send it to you. I will ship it to you. As long as you're in the United States, I will ship that to you. Okay, uh, some other groups in the area uh, that I think you should check out. So Central Ohio Azure Group, go to coazure.org. They also have a meetup site there and a Twitter account. They meet every second Monday. Not the Microsoft Office right now, I don't think, but you should definitely go and check them out and check out their meetups, especially if you're into Azure, stuff like that. Columbus App Dev User Group, this is uh, a group that's run by one of Ed's colleagues, I believe, uh, still, uh, Sammy. But uh, go ahead and check out ColumbusAppDevUserGroup.com. Uh, they used to meet at Improving Offices. I believe they still meet online at Teams slash Twitch. Go check them out there on Twitter as well, CMH, AppDev, UG, and a meetup site. Go check them out. Oof. I love the oof. Uh, the uh, pass, CBUS pass. So uh, I, I, I should have checked on this before the meeting. I don't think they... They're going to use the pass name anymore because pass has been dissolved. But uh, I assume there's still a community of users who are SQL Server and database interested. I know uh, Cleveland or Cincinnati has changed their name already. So I assume CBUS Pass will do a similar sort of thing. Go check them out, CBUS Pass on Meetup there. And they used to meet at IGS. But I believe Redgate's taken over Pass. So I don't know if they're still going to be affiliated or not. I haven't gone to those meetups. So. Uh, definitely check it out and report back here next month. Like, what's up with CBUS Pass? What's going on? Are they still meeting? Are they calling something different? Also, the Let's Talk IT Columbus. This is a user group for the non-technical skills that technical professionals uh, are still can find valuable and useful. So they meet online. They're still meeting online as far as I know. Uh, change association to unassociation. Make it CBUS Puss. I don't know about that name. Uh, let's uh, let's um, let's workshop that a little bit. Anyway, let's talk IT Columbus. Check this group out there. You can find you can email Aaron Petrie, Aaron Petrie at Improving, and they have a meetup link there as well. Go check them out. Take a screenshot of this. There's a lot to uh, read there. I don't think you're going to get the free food anymore, but uh, you might want to check that group out. All right, uh, upcoming calendar. So today we've got Ed Charbonneau talking Blazor, talking machine learning, talking Cosmos, talking full stack. It's great stuff. We're still working on a March speaker. I think we have some people in mind. Uh, I don't think we've settled on anybody yet, but that will be announced soon. We've got a speaker for April on uh, what's new in C-Sharp 9, so we definitely want to check out that one. We've got a speaker as far ahead as June, uh, penciled in. I'm not going to give details of that just yet because that's so far out, but that will probably be on serverless or Azure Functions. If you're interested in speaking, um, let us know. 
uh, especially some of these topics here that we're interested in, that, some, that we've got a list of people interested in these topics here. Uh, we've, got, we've maybe got the first one covered. We've got a few of those crossed off as covered. We've got Blazer and Cosmos being covered tonight by Ed. So thank you for the two for Ed. We're going to uh, double your fee, by the way, uh, for that. So thank you. Uh, he can hear me right now, but uh, you can't hear him. So he's laughing uproariously. But if you uh, speak on any of these topics or if any other topics you think might be interested uh, for a .NET user group, uh, let us know. You can email me uh, at mgroves. That's my email address, me at mgroves.com. I'll show you that here in the next slide. Uh, for the near future, we're going to be remote. But like I said, there's some things working on in the background to maybe go to a hybrid approach later on this year. Maybe if, uh, you know... <laughs> Lots of different factors that are outside of our control, but uh, that's why you need to subscribe to our social media accounts. If you're looking for work or if you're hiring, feel free to use the chat there and Twitch to, pub to post whatever you want about, hey, I'm looking for a job or, hey, I'm looking to hire. Uh, you know, we used to do this kind of thing in person, but uh, feel free to use the chat. Uh, it's open season on that sort of stuff. If you don't want to publish to the world that you're looking for a job because you don't want your current employer to see, you can email me. Uh, me at mgroves.com. Happy to make those connections behind the scenes. Keep that discreet. Um, I, I don't even charge a fee for it. It's just a, a service I'm providing for people who want to be discreet about it. Uh, so like Bleak Morn there, looking for work. There you go. If you're a recruiter looking to hire uh, or if you're you know just looking for someone to do some uh, cool stuff for you, check out Bleak Morn. Um, yeah, but if, otherwise, if you don't want to, to broadcast that, just email me, mgross.com. This is the same email address. You can contact me if you want to be a speaker or if you want to help out as part of the team. Uh, so we got some stuff in flux right now, but uh, here's the, this is the team right now. Uh, that's myself, Alan Barber, Matt, and Calvin. Matt is in the channel right now as Integer Man. Uh, so if you're interested in helping out in any way, if you want to help us find sponsors, help us find speakers, help us with some sort of uh, in-person uh, type of efforts that may or may not happen later on this year, uh, you can contact us there. And again, just for the new people, if you've not used Twitch before, this is how you interact with it. This is what it looks like from your desktop. Look at the chat, the chat prompt on the bottom right there. Just type in uh, your question, your comments, whatever you want to do. Just type in hello if you're going to be entered into the uh, entered into the drawing. Now, Ed Charbonneau is a experienced Twitch streamer. Uh, oh, thank you for cashing in your points there, Ed. Ed is an experienced Twitch streamer, so he's going to be looking at, he's going to be monitoring the chat for questions as he goes along. Uh, so I won't have to relay them to him this time around. So just throw them in the chat. Ed will be monitoring. He'll answer those questions uh, as best he can. And there'll be some time. <laughs> Couch Moe's DB. Oh, yes. Now we're talking. That's better than C-Bus Puss, I think. Uh, anyway, uh, he'll also have some time at the end for Q&A. So if you have a questions, you can throw those in the chat there towards the end. So... That's it. I'm going to hand things over now to Ed. So uh, let me take myself off the screen here, put it in speaker mode. Okay. And I'll take, uh, I'll turn on his audio. So can we get a audio check, please, Ed? Make sure it's loud enough for everybody. It's, uh, it's the most 2020 phrase of all time. Can you hear me yet? Can you hear me now? Yes. How's that audio? Can you see my screen. <laughs> audio sounding okay out there, uh, everybody in Twitch land. Is that loud enough for you? Ninja Man says it sounds great. I'm going to mute my own microphone. And Ed, please take it away. Everybody, a nice round of applause. Put some emotes in there for Ed Charbonneau. All right. So tonight we're going to talk about a little something I call a cosmic full stack. So we're going to take and mash up like all the new things. So I just, I, I just went for all the buzzwords, folks. I mean, really, that's what I did. Come on. Now, uh, Blazor, uh, ML.NET, and Cosmos DB, we're going to mash those things up and see what the future of .NET looks like. So just a quick uh, glance at what I'm about. I'm a Microsoft MVP, I'm a developer advocate for progress. Uh, we're the makers of the Telerik brand of tools. You might know a little something about Telerik. Uh, we've been in the .NET space for quite some time. Uh, that's the company I work for these days. Uh, I'm enjoying that uh, work as a developer advocate. You can find me on Twitch uh, pretty much every week, several times a week, uh, streaming about various things on uh, my own channel and the Code It Live channels. Make sure you follow those. Uh, if you're 
in the .NET ecosystem, then there are a lot of tools out there for us to use. And I'm the kind of person that is always looking into the future to try to figure out where the the latest uh, trends are to make sure that my my career is always safe and I've got um, you know some some new skills to use uh, as my career progresses. And when .NET 5 shipped, uh, we had all sorts of new things coming out, uh, Blazor and Cosmos DB and ML.NET. And there's all sorts of great things out there. And now we're, we're starting to head into .NET 6 territory. Can you believe that? Um, I don't have anything dot, .NET 6 specific in this talk yet, but uh, the first preview of .NET 6 shipped uh, just earlier last week. So there's they're starting to get um, some bits into our hands so we can start playing with that. And I'm already looking into that and some VR stuff. So I'm always looking out to see what the latest and greatest things are. And that's that's what this is all about. Uh, so there's three technologies. I already told you what they are, but uh, they're changing the .NET ecosystem. And when I, when I explore these things, I always try to do some kind of project that is not too involved, but gives me enough experience with the the tools and um, and the software that I learn something that's useful. Uh, so I learn a lot by doing. Um, I like to work on something that's challenging, and, and I try to like gamify it a little bit, make it fun, uh, come up with unique ideas to try to make it interesting to keep me entertained while I do it. Uh, if I'm not entertained by it, then I, I probably won't commit to it and keep doing it. So you'll you'll see all these kind of oddball projects coming out of uh, my my GitHub from time to time. So the the idea here is I'm going to learn something that's uh, next gen about uh, the .NET stack and build some kind of uh, real world like application that I can test some of these tools out in. Um, so. The, when I first dove into this, uh, it was currently at .NET 3. Um, everything's been upgraded to .NET 5 now. Uh, so this was right on the transition point uh, where we were starting to get ready for the .NET 5 release. Um, so just to go back and look at the tech stack I was using, uh, I was using Visual Studio 2019. Uh, it was in preview for most of that time, but now I'm on Visual Studio 2019 proper. Uh, .NET 3, which is now uh, migrated to .NET 5 and probably pretty soon to some of the .NET 6 previews. Um, this particular project is using Blazor Server. So uh, Blazor Server's actually got some um, interesting things that I can tell you about tonight. And it might convince you that's actually a good choice to use Blazor server side for some scenarios. Uh, I think there's some real upsides to have uh, with Blazor server. Blazor WebAssembly is also really awesome. We could talk about that as well. Uh, I'm happy to take questions and uh, show demos and things in Blazor WebAssembly too. Uh, ML.NET, I'm a, I'm a big fan of machine learning. Um, I like to dabble around there and uh, see what kind of crazy stuff that I can do with the, the tools that are out there. Uh, so I've had some fun, not only in this project, but in others with ML.NET. And uh, Cosmos DB is uh, something that's pretty interesting because it's, it's a new product for Microsoft. Um, there, you know, a lot of my uh, work history is based on building uh, CRUD applications with a SQL server. So uh, something like Cosmos DB is new to me. Um, and I thought that would be interesting to kind of throw into the mix and see what we could do with this. So some of the things I wanted to learn when I built this project um, are to learn about Blazor server side. Uh, a lot of attention was uh, going on with Blazor WebAssembly, and I thought I'd take a pretty um, objective look at Blazor server side and see what it was capable of and, and what the use cases there might be. Um, it's uh, it, even though it's called Blazor server side, it still runs. Um, it still acts um, as a client side um, experience. So I'm using the web browser. Uh, I have what what is like a client side .net. Um, so I want to evaluate that scenario and see what that experience was like. Do I still need to write a bunch of JavaScript code if I'm using Blazor server or Blazor WebAssembly? Uh, so I wanted to evaluate those things. 
Um, wanted to learn a bit more about ML.net and uh, also Cosmos DB and see how it stacked up against what I was used to, uh, SQL Server. So I actually started this project out using uh, SQLite and then migrated it to Cosmos DB. And I can tell you what some of the pain points are there as we go along. Uh, so one of the first things I wanted to look at was, can ML.NET integrate with Blazor? Um, the short answer of that is yes. Uh, long answer is you can, uh, and you can do it in various ways, uh, but you cannot use ML.NET directly with Blazor WebAssembly. However, you can with Blazor Server, and I can get into the details of that later. Um, I wanted to see if I could use some of the front-end dev tools that I'm used to, uh, like SAS, which is a CSS precompiler. So that's something that I really enjoy using. And uh, I wanted to see if I could use that with Blazor as well. Um, I also wanted to see if I could easily replace a SQL database with Cosmos DB and still use Entity Framework. So those were some of the things I set out to do. And I ended up with an app that looks like this. This is uh, an app I call Blazeport. And uh, we'll, we'll show some demos of Blazeport tonight. Um, and I'm happy to take questions about any piece of it that I built um, as we go along. But uh, it's using all three of these technologies uh, to make this dashboard um, and kind of like book travel booking system happen. So let's talk about Blazor. So Blazor is a brand new framework from Microsoft. It's actually been out officially for over a year now. And uh, the second release came with .NET 5. And it is extremely uh, easy to work with. Um, the performance has gotten much better over the last release. Uh, it comes with everything you see here uh, packed right in uh, to the framework. So. Uh, it's on par with uh, the other front-end frameworks that are out there, like Angular or React, the popular JavaScript frameworks. Uh, the unique thing about Blazor is it does everything with c -sharp and .NET. So let's talk about the two different run modes of Blazor. Uh, there's currently two different deployments that you can use. Um, and there's actually some more that are coming uh, in the future here as well. So we'll, we'll see Blazor on the desktop with .NET 6, hopefully. They're already uh, talking about templates and, and how those might look uh, in the latest previews. But let's talk about Blazor WebAssembly and how it works. Uh, we'll talk about Blazor Server as well. I'll spend probably a little bit more time in this talk on Blazor Server, uh, since that's what I'm using in the application. Uh, so let's get started with how client-side works. So in a typical client-side application, uh, we send our JavaScript and HTML to the browser. Uh, the browser parses that JavaScript. It compiles it internally, turns that into bytecode, and interacts with the DOM APIs. Uh, along came WebAssembly. This is a new web standard that is part of your browser. And with WebAssembly, we can actually inject bytecode or serve bytecode directly to the browser, and that browser can consume the bytecode and do work with it. So that eliminates the need for us to feed it JavaScript and worry about all of that compilation and parsing happening on the client. Instead, that makes the parser and compiler available to uh, outside of the browser, so we can add our own tools there, and we can add other um, ecosystems like C++, for example. So what the .NET team has done is they've compiled the .NET runtime to uh, WebAssembly bytecode, so we can give the, uh, the browser um, the .NET runtime and let our .NET applications run directly in the browser and talk to the DOM. So that's how Blazor works. So Blazor is using that .NET runtime, and we're loading the .NET runtime into the browser, and then we build our .NET application in normal DLL files, normal .NET uh, class libraries, uh, run directly client side. So this takes a little bit of a different spin on things when we go to server side Blazor. 
So instead of sending the .NET runtime down to the browser and running the Blazor framework uh, on the client, we instead treat uh, the client like a thin client. And we run the .NET, uh, we don't run the normal full .NET runtime in the browser and do all of the processing on the browser. So the browser acts as a thin client and we set up a signal R connection with the client. And then the client makes requests to the server and uh, computes the state of that page. For example, if some text changes or a component gets updated, uh, that, that information gets sent to the browser so the browser can do the DOM update. So the only thing that is sent across the wire, and this is sent across a SignalR web uh, socket connection, is the events and some of the state and then the updates that belong to the browser. We're not re-rendering the entire browser uh, with each request and response. We're only re-rendering the portion of the component that changed. Uh, so this event and update system is very efficient. There's very little data traffic that is flowing over the wire when this is happening. Uh, so it's you know typical thin client model where all the processing is on the server and the browser is just there to support that view layer. Uh, one thing that's really, really nice about server-side Blazor is everything is running on the server. So you don't have to worry about writing a web API layer because you're not in a RESTful scenario. So you're not talking to a RESTful client. You have a real-time connection to it. Um, it's more like an RPC model. And uh, you don't have to write those uh, web APIs, you can just focus more on getting the application built. Um, and this vertical slice architecture is really nice. If you've ever seen uh, Jimmy Bogard uh, talk about vertical slices, there's a lot to be liked about this approach to building an application. Uh, so you'll see that your project structure gets a lot smaller with server-side Blazor if you choose to go with something like this. Um, if you have other companion apps, something like Xamarin or maybe a desktop component, that's sharing uh, web APIs and uh, other logic, this might not be the right route for you. But if you're solely focused on building uh, just a web application uh, that's delivering a web experience, then you'll write a lot less code uh, with this server-side architecture. So if we compare the two uh, deployment methods here, uh, we have client-side Blazor, that has uh, very little server overhead. It's basically serving up static uh, assets at this point. Um, and you could have a uh, web API and things like that on the server. But for the most part, you're just serving up static .NET libraries and other web assets that get to um, that, that get interacted with on the client. Um, it's a RESTful uh, scenario. So it's like your typical JavaScript application um, like React or Angular. And uh, we rely on things like a web API to serve data to our application. Um, what's nice about this is it allows us to do things like offline um, uh, type of applications. P it's PWA compatible. So if you have users that aren't connected uh, all of the time, then uh, you can rely on this client-side architecture to kind of fill in the gaps. Um, it doesn't re rely on that constant connection uh, like the server-side does, which we'll talk about here in a moment. Um, it does have a larger payload size. This is coming down quite a bit. Um, over the last two releases with Blazor, the play payload, side has, payload size has dropped quite a bit. It's still around about a meg. Um, I think we'll see that drop even more with .NET 6. Uh, only time will tell there, but I think it'll come down yet again. Um, it is a disconnected environment. So some of the benefits that I told you about server-side earlier, uh, which I'll reiterate again, um, is you're, you're going to have a little bit more of a development stack. You're going to have that web API layer to make those RESTful endpoints happen. So on server-side Blazor, uh, this is kind of the other side of the coin where we have a very small payload size. So we're trading payload here for uh, the responsibility of computing. Uh, 
So we have a smaller payload size, uh, but with that, we'll have to consume some server resources because the server is going to be processing all of that um, uh, client interaction that's happening on our, our web application. So now we're responsible for all the processing power, but the payload size is literally just a few K of data. So it boots up very fast. Uh, there's not a lot of traffic going over the wire. Um, there's a lot less abstraction. Like I said, you can use that vertical, vertical slice architecture and throw away your web APIs if you can. Um, and uh, there's a lot of server rendering power there. So the, these pages boot up just extremely fast. Um, the downside to server-side Blazor is the connection is always required because it's using WebSockets. So your application will pause and uh, it will show like a, a waiting to reconnect screen if you're not connected to your application because it needs that connection to do anything at all. Uh, so if you're building an application where your uh, clients are mobile and they're roaming, their connection might drop from time to time, then server-side Blazor might not be a good choice for that. And you would likely go with client-side Blazor. Uh, that also goes for like high latency, obviously. If you're using, uh, if your clients are, you know, on 3G connections or, or less, you're, you're going to have a bad time with server-side Blazor. Uh, your, your bottleneck is going to be that latency. <laughs> which JavaScript uh, is which JavaScript framework is under a, a megabyte uh, once you have five dollar gift card. So uh, talking about uh, JavaScript payload sizes, um, uh, it looks like Matt and a few others might have been onto the right path here when I'm talking about payload size and .NET being quite large. Um, so what I've what I've experienced is, a Blazor application with WebAssembly starts off slightly large at about a meg 0.2. Um, and as you build that application, that size really doesn't change much. So the bulk of the application is in the .NET runtime itself. Um, your application code, those DLL files are fairly small um, and they remain fairly small. Uh, with JavaScript applications like Angular and React, they tend to start off small and then as you add code to those applications, they grow pretty quickly. And uh, in, at the end game, you end up with either a Blazor application or a JavaScript application that are roughly the same payload. So that's been uh, what I've seen so far. Um, I, I, I think the .NET stuff is coming a long way and uh, we'll, we'll see a time frame pretty soon where um, we, we start having some additional benefits from the Blazor side of things rather than it being kind of this equal uh, tied race. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about what Blazor is and isn't. Um, it is client-side C-sharp. Um, if you're using Blazor WebAssembly specifically, it's client-side C-sharp. Uh, it is using web standard technologies. So everything I mentioned for Blazor WebAssembly um, it's using web, WebAssembly, uh, which is a web standard. Uh, if you're using the server-side technology, then WebSockets is a web standard. So we're all web, web standard across the board. Um, and it uses uh, the latest .NET runtimes as well. Uh, so you can use any of your existing uh, .NET uh, code, as long as it doesn't rely on something that doesn't exist in a web application. For example, you can't take like system drawing off of uh, Windows or uh, something very device specific from the Xamarin world. It has to be generic .NET code. Uh, any of those type of things will run in Blazor. Um, what it's not, uh, it's not Silverlight again. So we don't have any plugins to make this thing work. So Blazor doesn't require anything by the client to make this run. Um, it does have some similarities to web forms in, in the way you mark up your code, uh, but it doesn't have the uh, view state type of behavior that, um, that, that web forms had. It's not trying to replace statefulness. Um, it's, uh, it has some similarities in my opinion because uh, it's just .NET and it, it, it writes like .NET and web forms does the same thing. Uh, there's no transpiled code either. This isn't um, 
taking your .NET code and turning it into JavaScript, for example. It's not another version of TypeScript in any way. Um, in fact, your, your .NET code isn't compiled to WebAssembly either. Uh, the .NET runtime is the only thing that has already been pre-compiled to WebAssembly. Now, with .NET 6, there may be a small change there where some of your code uh, has the option to be compiled into WebAssembly, but we haven't seen that uh, enter the ecosystem yet. Um, it's only something that's been talked about on a tentative roadmap. Uh, from a developer perspective, uh, so from a DX perspective, Blazor uh, offers .NET developers the ability to use uh, uh, .NET standard libraries in their applications. Uh, one really good example of that is um, I can go out to NuGet and grab um, a uh, Markdown converter off of NuGet and just use that in my client-side Blazor application. And I won't have any conflicts at all with that working in that runtime. Uh, so I can use existing .NET libraries that I'm familiar with. Um, it's using MS Build and C Sharp. These are all tech that I'm very familiar with uh, versus on the JavaScript side of things. Um, I've had my fair share of frustrations with NPM and NPM packages and the amount of pollution they cause on your uh, machine when you're you're developing, uh, and the amount of headaches that Webpack has caused me over the years. Uh, I've had uh, a lot of rough experiences with Webpack and it not providing a whole lot of useful error messages when things don't go right. Um, I've had a lot more luck in the .NET side with uh, MS Build and compiled languages. Um, if you're uh, writing a lot of C-sharp code on other platforms, uh, you're doing uh, full stack development, uh, that sort of thing. Maybe you're a Xamarin developer and so on. You're, you already know C-sharp, uh, then there's no use in having to learn TypeScript and JavaScript to do what you already are doing. So that's, that's an added benefit as well. You don't have to have that uh, change of context when you're thinking about how to build your your code in the front end versus the back end. And there's also code sharing that you can do full stack with Blazor as well, because your, um, your C-sharp code works on the client and on the server. So you can share things like validation and models and, and those sort of things. Uh, it's got a rich ecosystem as well. Again, I work for uh, Progress and I was uh, one of the people that brought Blazor to Progress and suggest that we build web components uh, for, for this ecosystem. And we're up to about 60 plus components now. We have all the things that you need to build a line of business app these days. Uh, so charts, graphs, grids, pop-up boxes, the whole nine yards. Um, I can show you more of that uh, in a bit. But I've talked enough about Blazor so far and we haven't quite got to ml.net yet. Before we do, let's take a quick look at the app. We saw a screenshot of it, but we haven't quite seen it run yet. Um, again, I'm gonna use Blazor server for this. Um, my handy zoom tool is gonna take off on me. There we go. So I'm gonna use Blazor server for this. And I've got a couple uh, projects in um, the solution here. I've got Blaze port, which is my application. I'll tell you about it in just a second. I've got some unit tests, because uh, unit tests, I, I heard you have to have those to be a developer. Um, I've got something called a trip cost service and a trip cost trainer. We'll get into that portion of things in the next section when I start talking about uh, machine learning. Let's focus on Blazeport for a minute. So this is a uh, Blazor server application that's using that... Um, that vertical slice architecture that I was talking about. And I quite like the vertical slices because they let me break down the application into features rather than uh, splitting things up kind of like model view controller does, uh, where I've got uh, my concerns spread across uh, controllers and controller actions. Uh, with this 
uh, Blazor server application, all of the work that is being done um, is in each of the features that you see represented by the folders here. So all of the uh, admin tasks are in, in the admin folder, and then the individual tasks or features that belong to that administration function are inside of folders beneath it. And all of their view models and things are associated with those folders. So there's not a bunch of code spread out all over my project. Everything's divided up into those slices that you see. Uh, for example, on our home screen, which you'll see here in a second, we have a trip configuration tool. And this is what we'll use to book our travel inside of the application. And all of the view models and all of the widgets that make that, uh, that trip configuration screen light up, um, they are all in this uh, folder because there's no need to spread those things throughout the project. You can see my trip configuration here. Um, I have the form. I have the view model. I have the state management object in here. Anything that's associated with this function of the application is right here, easily found in this folder. So let's take a quick look at the app and see what this looks like. And again, I could move this over to a Blazor WebAssembly application if I wanted to, but uh, for this project, I thought it would be uh, useful to learn more about Blazor Server. And it doesn't seem to want to load <laughs> my application. I've had a lot of ghosts in the machine today. So it was running here a minute ago. Let's see if uh, I think my hotkey was just not working properly. Let's see if this, uh, this does a trick here. Let's try to run it with debugging. So sometimes streaming can take a little bit of a hit on the CPU and it won't um, boot up right away. And in fact, I think I'm locked out of my UI here for a moment. So bear with me. I have either, you know what it is. I think I've lost my second screen. So this has been my day-to-day, -day, folks. That is what's happened. I've lost my second monitor. And, yep, I lost my second monitor. So um, I was not seeing questions. And my second monitor was froze. So I may not have seen your questions. And when I'm joining chat again, it's not going to show me anything from the history. So give me a moment to shift this back over to another monitor. And at least we can see my application now. Sorry, if you can hear me, bear with me for a moment. The usual technical difficulties for a live stream. All right, so quick in the chat room, just give me like a, a shout out, thumbs up, whatever. Just let me know you can still hear me because uh, I, I could, my monitor froze. Okay, cool. So monitor is unfrozen. And uh, let's try this again. Let me close these out and uh, let's stop the, the live or the, uh, the app from running. And you can see where I've tried to start it like five times. It's coming up on my, my dead monitor, which had a frozen chat room on it. So I couldn't see it. Uh, here we go. So now we're back up here and um, this is the Blazeport application that's using these new technologies. And uh, in my Blazor application, I'm going to click on uh, Start Trip. And you can see I get the trip configuration panel. This is what I was showing in Visual Studio uh, here on the right. So I've got my trip configuration uh, feature folder here with all of the model, the form, the state, the validation, all of those things are in this uh, this section of the screen here. 
And I can come in here and these are the Telerik Blazor um, components in here. So I can select a nice date picker. I can dial up the number of passengers and I can select my departure location. Uh, let's depart from earth and we'll, we'll uh, take off from Cape Canaveral. And then let's go to the, let's go to Mars and we'll land on Mount Sharp on Mars. And then we'll estimate the trip cost there. And since we're using Blazor server, this is just instantaneous. And uh, we've got an output here that shows our departure location, where we're gonna arrive to. It's gonna count down when our trip starts. Uh, and it's estimated a price here for us, just, just $120,000. Now, I don't know about you. This might seem like a lot of money for you, but I think uh, this is pretty cheap on the grand scheme of things. Um, so $120,000 is probably pretty cheap actually. Uh, so we're going to send two passengers to Mars and the trip takes this many days and flies this many miles. Um, this price, this price right here is estimated by uh, machine learning, believe it or not. So how do I get that price from all of these parameters that we entered in the application? If I edit my trip data again, you can see the departure date, the trip uh, departure locations and so on. Um, this is all fed into a machine learning model to give us this price estimate. So we're gonna talk a little bit about uh, how to, um, how, how I'm able to estimate these trip costs. Uh, I think you'll find it pretty amazing, if not just entertaining. So let's talk about uh, ML.net. So ML.net is an open source cross-platform machine learning framework that comes from the folks at Microsoft. Um, why would you choose to use something like ML.net uh, if you're already a .NET developer? then you just lower the learning curve. Uh, ML.NET's uh, a lot easier to get into than some of these other machine learning platforms. And I'll talk about that in just a minute. Um, if you're familiar with uh, uh, Python or R or Lisp, those are uh, things that you would normally use for machine learning. Um, with ML.NET, this lets us use C Sharp um, on top of those things as well. So we, we have the ability to interchange some code there if we wanted to, but uh, C Sharp is the, the primary way we're gonna build these things. Um, it's compatible with the Onyx file format. Uh, so we can import and export these models to other systems. And uh, it's built for speed and accuracy. And I'll, I'll show some of that as well. Uh, I think there's some really cool stuff that we can do with ML.NET uh, in regards to, to building uh, models very quickly. If you're wondering where Microsoft just came up with ML.NET all of the sudden, uh, it's actually something that was dogfooded internally for a while. So this is actually something that was a product within before it became a product outside. So it's used in things like uh, Microsoft Outlook and Power BI. And if you're not familiar with this weird icon over here, this is actually the Defender uh, logo. So this is the Windows Defender security icon. So these are all actually using uh, what became ML.NET. So this isn't something brand new. It's, it's something that they've taken from the inside and started to make it available outside. If you're not familiar with the machine learning process, it kind of helps to understand the, uh, how that workflow happens in machine learning. So we start off with data. Uh, we train that data. Uh, we test that uh, model and evaluate it to see how well um, it has uh, predicted the outcome. And then we can take that model um, and feed uh, new data into it and come out with predictions. And based on those predictions and how accurate they are, we may want to repeat this process again uh, to get a more accurate model. So we keep training it feeding it new data, testing that data, evaluating those uh, outputs, and then creating brand new models that then can predict data more accurately. And this cycle continues. You could think of it a little bit like a red, green, or factor process in uh, test-driven development. So in, in that case, um, our, our unit test is kind of the model prediction. Uh, it's not as uh, red and green here, where we're not producing a true false value 
but uh, rather a percentage of accuracy, like how well um, or how, uh, how accurate is this prediction going to be? Uh, so we'll talk a little bit about that process here as well. Uh, so in the application that I built, uh, we're predicting a price. So we're predicting the price or the cost of that trip that we're going to be taking from Earth to Mars. Uh, so we're, we're going to build a, um, a model for doing pricing in there. And you might be thinking right now, and I, I haven't uh, looked back at uh, the chat room here to see if anybody has tried to figure out yet how I've predicted the price of taking passengers to Mars. Um, so let's let's talk a little bit about that. So I faked it. Okay, I faked it. No. <laughs> so what what I did uh, is I took um, I took some data that was built around taxi service in Manhattan. So I took the uh, data which gave us the distance of point A to point B, um, and it gave us the taxi fare based on uh, predicted from that, that distance and some other uh, inputs that I'll show you here in just a second. Um, and I figured if the furthest point of Manhattan, uh, a trip from the furthest point here to the furthest point here cost X dollars, then if this point was Earth and this point was Mars, then we'll add some zeros and we'll call it a day. So uh, it's a lot of showmanship, but it is actually doing some uh, cost prediction. So it's not completely fake. It is actually exercising a prediction model, but there's a little showmanship on top of it, just uh, extrapolating some of the numbers to uh, give it a little bit of flair to say, we went from Earth to Mars and this is how much it's going to cost. So just adding zeros really is all we're doing here. But uh, it was a lot of fun. And um, I can show you now how we built that. So let's go back to the application. I'm going to collapse Blazeport for a moment while we focus on the machine learning. <laughs> uh, fun, we're having some fun discussions now. This is good. Uh, Feel free to make jokes as well. This is all meant to be entertaining, by the way. Um, in this application, we have the trip cost service. And this service is consumed by Blazeport. So the trip cost service is a, uh, the Blazeport application depends on uh, the trip cost service. Uh, the trip cost service uses a machine learning model and uh, the machine learning model is built with this part of the application, which is the trip cost trainer. So the trip cost trainer is an ML.NET application. And this, uh, this is our, our trainer. And it will build and output a uh, machine learning model for us. So this is a console application that will create the model, which is fed into our trip cost service, which Blazeport then uses to get the, um, the cost of our trip. So we'll run the trip cost trainer. Um, I'm gonna come up and move this very helpful toolbar out of my way. And I'm gonna change from Blazeport here to my trip cost trainer. And we'll go ahead and run this um, this mo machine learning model. So the uh, the command line tool here is going out and it's grabbing my data, and it is going to go through that data and process a machine learning model. And in a moment here, it should spit out a bunch of uh, data for us, and it's doing a regression model. And again, all of the code for this is in .NET, and I'll, we'll, we'll go ahead, we'll write this code live on the stream here in just a minute. It'll be a lot of fun. Um, so here's the metrics for our model. Uh, this all has to do with the accuracy of this machine learning model. It's about 92% uh, accurate. So it's, uh, it's a pretty accurate 
uh, model. And uh, when we run that command line tool, um, you will see a folder here called ML models, and there is a zip file. Now this is that Onyx formatted um, file. And this is the actual machine learning model. It is a zip format. Uh, that is a common format for this. Uh, this zip file is then grabbed by a script and it is given to our Blazeport application. And you will find it in my WW root folder along with all of the static assets for the application. So you can see I have images here. Um, and then in another folder is that same zip file that we built with our command line tool. The service uh, for Blazeport, so the trip cost service, if we look at our trip cost service, let's take a look at the interface as well. So the interface for this is pretty simple. It gives, it's a asking for a path to our model. So what it wants is to us to resolve that, um, that zip files path for the machine learning model to load that uh, ML model. And then we'll give it a, um, a trip, which we configure with our tool on that screen. We'll pass that trip into the, um, into the model and it will give us back a trip predict prediction. So let's take a look at the service. Uh, the service uh, imp implements the interface here that grabs that model path. Um, it's going to load the model. It's going to create a new machine learning context. Um, it's going to open the file and read it into the system here and load, uh, load that machine learning model and pass the trip in and give us back a prediction. So this is how ml.net works. Uh, so we load basically what is a zip file into memory. Uh, that zip file contains the trained model. So the trained model can then just take inputs and give us outputs. So we'll get, um, we'll get the model in memory. We'll give it an input. It will give us an output. Uh, so then we end up with a score. And since we're flying to space and we're not taking taxis, we'll multiply that score by uh, uh, by 1,000. Uh, and then we return that prediction to the application. Pretty cool. All right. So let's let's rebuild this service now. So uh, we talked about uh, the trip uh, prediction service, and I showed you some code here. And you might be wondering how to write a machine learning model. It's probably a bunch of uh, new code that you might not understand. There's a lot of brand new APIs in here. Uh, there's a lot of stuff going on underneath of all these data structures and whatnot. Um, but lucky for us, we don't have to actually physically handwrite all of this code. So I'm going to back out of my project here, just kind of collapse things down a little bit. And I'm going to come up to this solution here. And actually, maybe at the wrong level, I think I need to add this to a project. Um, so it doesn't really matter where I click in here. Wherever you would want your machine learning code to be generated, you would click on that element in your, um, in your project tree. And then we're going to say add. And then we're going to say add machine learning. So I'm just going to point at this here. So I went to my project and I clicked add machine learning. So this is some really cool stuff, I think. We're going to add machine learning. This would be in like a class library or somewhere we'd want to put that code when it gets generated. Uh, now we have a wizard that's going to help us build this machine learning model. So I can come in here and say, I want to predict the value. So I have some taxi data that I want to predict the outcome of. Um, I don't have any other way to run this but my local machine. So I'm going to go ahead and click next step. Uh, now I need some data. So I can use a SQL server. Or I can use some file, um, some flat files. I'm going to go ahead with a file because I have a CSV file. Uh, so I've got a taxi fare training data set. It's an Excel file or a CSV file. I'm going to go ahead and grab that. Uh, Visual Studio's read that file in. 
Uh, the next thing I want to do is say, what am I predicting from this data? So in this column to predict, I need to label what the output will be. So I want to predict the fare. What is the taxi fare going to be? Um, I also have the ability to come in here and modify these columns if I need to. So for example, um, I discussed this with some machine learning folks to see if my head was in the right place. But if I'm taking a taxi, I don't necessarily know how long it's going to take. And I would likely need another model to predict how long that trip would take in order for me to use this field. Take out the trash. And Alexis telling me to take out the trash right now. Uh, live streaming is fun, isn't it? Uh, all right. So I'm going to ignore the trip time because I don't have a model to predict how long this taxi ride is going to take yet. So I'm just going to kick that out of my data set for now, just so it doesn't interfere with anything and give me any kind of false uh, positives. So now I've eliminated a column from my data set. Um, I've taken and labeled the output column of my data set. I'm going to click next. <laughs> there was no irony lost in that integer, man. That was the best. Uh, that's a good one. Uh, so here's one of the speed and accuracy things that I like about ML.net with this uh, training tool is I can tell my trainer to look at the data for a certain amount of time. So this is fairly unique here. Um, I can set this for as long or as short as I'd like it uh, to train the, on this data. So what the ML.NET trainer here is going to do, this wizard is going to do, when I click start training, it's going to go through and take that data and run it through several uh, machine, common machine learning uh, models. So you can see it's picking the trainers over here. And it's got five of the top trainers explored. So it's, it's looking at a fast tree regression. Now, some of this is based off of that box that I selected on the initial screen, where it gave me several choices. And the second one was to predict a, a, a price. So it is going through the things that you would use to predict a price using machine learning. So I don't have to know that much about machine learning to use this. Um, it's going to help guide the way. Um, it also goes through and measures these algorithms to see which one produced the most accurate results on that data set. Now, what's nice about the time-based training is I can keep upping this time and feeding it more data and seeing how these outputs play out. So if my 10 second training gives me a 90% accuracy and I up this thing to train for an hour and it doesn't change that accuracy all that much, I can start weeding out like the happy space. Do I need to train this for 10 seconds, 10 minutes, five minutes, two minutes? What gives me the best for bang for the buck here? Uh, so this time-based training is really interesting, I think, and something that can be leveraged uh, to help speed up this process. Uh, so next, I'm going to go into a step where I can test my data. We should get pretty close here to what our application outputs. Um, so there are some hidden fields in the application you don't see. And uh, these might have a little bit of bearing on uh, what um, our output from our application is. But essentially what I'm doing here when I pick my trip is I'm picking some drop-down boxes that eventually equate to some sort of distance traveled. So when I select these, uh, when I go from Earth to uh, Mars or Earth to the moon, um, you'll see that it costs uh, $27 um, in our machine learning model. Now, I can't remember off the top of my head um, how far of a trip that is, but you get the idea. We can come in here and plug in uh, the trip distance, and we will get a prediction of the fair amount. So we can live test our model that has been built by this wizard, and it will give us uh, the outputs here. So we can quickly test this out 
and kind of get a quick uh, check on whether this is working for us or not. And we can we can put in uh, different passenger counts and, and all sorts of stuff here and just fire away at this. So I think this is, is really cool. Um, and it's a really fast way to build um, a machine learning model without having to hand write this entire process, which I have done because this tool did not exist at the time I built this application. So it's kind of like one of those, uh, you know, those things in software where you spend all of this time building it to find out that there's just an easier way to do it. Um, I built uh, this ml.net application by hand using the tutorials on uh, docs.microsoft.com only to find out that they were releasing this nice builder tool uh, just a few months later. So uh, not bitter. <laughs> I learned a lot uh, and uh, I, it's really cool to see the tool come along. So let's go to the next step in the tool and hit consume. Um, in here, I won't do this because I don't wanna uh, mess up the project I already have built. Um, if I hit add to solution, this will new up a console application inside of my solution. And uh, it would look very, very similar to the one that you see in the trip cost trainer that you have here. Um, the only difference between what is output from this tool versus what I have in the trip cost trainer is I've done some refactoring on it to uh, make it a little bit e uh, more user-friendly for the purpose of this presentation and um, to uh, enable the scripting to put uh, the trip cost uh, training model into the right folder, but also um, export what I call analysis.json. Let's take a look at analysis.json for a second. So as my model is being built, uh, I'm piping that data into a JSON output. So when th that model process runs, the one that you saw both me run from the command line and the process that you saw me run from Visual Studio, uh, as those things run, you can, um, all right, they're, they're going to go line by line through your data and uh, do test predictions on it to see what the accuracy of the model is. So as it's doing that test prediction uh, phase, uh, my model is piping the data out to a JSON file so I can use that in my Blazeport application. So what I wanted in my Blazeport app is in my administrator section, I want to check the prediction engine, engine status. And what this is going to do is we're using a Telerik UI for Blazor uh, chart. And we're charting that JSON data across this chart. So what we see here is the accuracy of the model. We're at 95%. And the, the line that you see here is giving us a visual representation of the accuracy of this machine learning model. So now we're taking Blazor and we're taking the machine learning data and showing that machine learning data in Blazor to get a better idea of how uh, it's performing. So what we've got here along this line is as this line goes up, these are all the test data points. And the closer they hug the line, the more accurate the model is. So if I have data, uh, for example, that is on an XY coordinate out here, uh, these would be these would represent outliers. If I have a cluster of data that is out in these regions, that would represent uh, just a bad model that's not predicting well. So the further the, um, the uh, variance from this line, then the less accurate the model is. So these are nice and closely clustered together. And this gives me a good idea that my model's fairly accurate. Pretty cool stuff, I think. Uh, this was a, a lot of fun to build uh, this part of the application and see all the various parts working together. I'm going to go ahead and cancel out of this. Again, that will generate the code for you that you see here, minus some syntactic sugar that I gave it and some additional outputs for that screen that you just saw. 
but it does fully exercise that machine learning model with that trip configuration that you see right here. So all of the data points that are on this uh, on the screen get put into a um, a view model. That view model gets passed into the machine learning. Uh, and the machine learning gives us back a trip cost. Uh, I'm going to try to go through this last part pretty quick. It is the um, least um, the uh, it has the least impact on the application as a whole. Uh, but I'm quickly talk about Cosmos DB before we end here. Um, Cosmos DB, uh, this is a globally distributed uh, multi model multi model database uh, designed for low latency and massive scale. There's some really cool things that uh, Cosmos DB can do uh, when you're talking about replication. I've done some uh, replication in SQL. It's not a fun process. Um, Cosmos DB makes this easy. Uh, it's literally just point and click when you're in um, the uh, Azure um, portal. Uh, it supports five different API types. Uh, the main one we're going to look at here is the SQL API. What's interesting about the SQL API is it enables us to use um, N80 framework, which is something that I already know. So I was trying to apply something that I already know to something that I didn't know. Now, there's some trade-offs here, and I'll explain those in a moment as I uh, go through the rest of these slides. Um, so we have the different models that we can use. So these are different ways of querying our data. Uh, there's different consistency levels here. So we can adjust kind of a sliding scale. Um, not all platforms are able to do this. Uh, Cosmos has one of the more um, gra graduated uh, ways of doing this. So this lets us trade off either high latency or low latency and accuracy. Uh, so the part I really want to focus on here is the, the, mental, the mental model. So switching from SQL to Cosmos uh, does require code changes. That's because Cosmos is a document style database. It is not a, um, it's not a SQL database or a re relational database. So while I did know N80 framework and it, did, it does support uh, Cosmos DB, the mental model of accessing the data and writing queries is much different. So there are uh, join in um, uh, other syntax for querying that don't apply uh, the same ways to a document database as they do to a SQL database. And you have a much better expert here at talking about these things. Uh, Matt Groves can go into much greater detail on the differences between a document style database and a SQL style database. But the gist of it is uh, you can use N80 framework, you can write SQL code, but both of those things are very hard to apply to a document style database. So you are going to run up against a little bit of a learning curve, even though they're using things that you quote already know. So that's one of the things that I had some issues with. Also, uh, seeding and migration is done differently uh, in these systems as well. Uh, migrations really aren't even a thing in a document style database like Cosmos. Uh, so you're not even going to have that there. So writing the, the, uh, the logic to make that happen um, is quite different. Uh, so you can do things in EF core, uh, like say add DB context, you spin up a new context, and then you can write some basic queries using where statements and whatnot. It's the, the joining of things. Uh, and uh, selecting relationships and whatnot that is much, much different. So we'll summarize real quick here, and then I'll take questions. Um, Bla is Blazor worth the hype? Uh, I wrote this, this presentation about two years ago, um, and Blazor is still going very strong, if not stronger. So I'd say, yes, absolutely. Uh, I've enjoyed working with it, not only on this project, but many others since. Um, uh, I looked at MVVM along with some other design patterns when I was looking at the vertical slices architecture. Uh, MVVM butts heads with uh, with Blazor, so uh, that one I'm I'm still on the fence with. Um, I still have people asking me pretty fre frequently if they should use MVVM and Blazor, and my my gut always reaches for no. 
uh, don't do it. It's uh, Blazor is, feels very MVP already, model view presenter, and uh, adding another view layer on top of it um, or pattern on top of it uh, seems to butt heads. So uh, try it before you end up or before you make a decision to go with something like MVVM, try without it first. Um, was my machine learning uh, project a success? Yes and no. So I did end up using server-side Blazor because ML.net is not compatible with client-side Blazor in WebAssembly. If you're trying to run the model on the client, it will fail. You have to run the model on the server uh, so that means you have to um, call it through a web API if you're going to use uh, Blazor WebAssembly. That's not a big deal. Uh, but you cannot run the model on the client. The only reason you'd probably want to run a model on a client is for, um, for privacy reasons. So if you're processing like uh, image data, things like that, uh, personal data that a person might not want to share with the cloud, you could actually do the, the uh, machine learning on the client and not send personal details up to a server to have it processed. Um, did EF work with Cosmos? I think I explained that one. Um, it does work. It, it does what it's advertised to do. But since those two uh, systems are very different, some of the queries are not written. Uh, so the, the, the queries you write are not going to be a one-to-one -one translation, uh, even though they're both entity framework. So there's some oddities there. Um, I know we're starting to get close to time, so I'll take questions. And uh, if uh, I'd be happy to show any part of the application uh, that we we have here as well. And hey, hey Ed, uh, I've got some yeah. questions uh, from when your screen froze up that I can I can ask you to start it. But if you oh, excellent, if you have more questions, feel free to dump them in the chat there, and I'll I'll bring those up as they come. So. Uh, first one, you kind of covered this already, but I'll, I'll ask again. What what benefit did you get writing in Blazor versus available frameworks for JavaScript in the marketplace? And that question's from MicroCompass. Okay, so I'm going to go back to some of the very first slides that I showed because this still holds true even after writing uh, this and many other um, application demos. Uh, Blazor, I don't have to worry about this. Uh, this is, this was a major headache for me. Um, the, some people are, are efficient with these uh, tools. If you're, if you're building apps with React and you're comfortable with NPM and Webpack and TypeScript and your, uh, your team is efficient using those tools, then keep using them. Um, I personally was having issues all of the time with Webpack not working right, or uh, NPM causing some weird little thing that uh, that was annoying me. Uh, for example, it doesn't do this anymore to my my knowledge. But uh, initially, what happens with NPM on Windows is you'd get weird errors like the file path is too long, and your your build system would just hang up, and uh, you'd have to go in and like uh, you know put in nuclear launch codes in NPM to clear packages out and get them to where they, they didn't do ridiculous things like that. Um, I also had a project I was working on where Webpack decided that something in the CSS file was JavaScript and tried to run it. Therefore, it crashed, but it didn't give me an error message that had any type of intelligence to go find out where uh, to go in and, and fix that. So I spent uh, a good day just trying to debug uh, an application that wasn't broken, only to find out that uh, some uh, CSS dependency I pulled in uh, had uh, broken Webpack. So uh, that that alone was enough for me to get frustrated and, and hope that there was a better solution somewhere else. Uh, there's also the uh, the fact that you don't have to context switch all of the time between TypeScript and JavaScript. Uh, there are occasions in Blazor where you do need JavaScript for something, uh, but you're writing so little of JavaScript that most of the time it doesn't even make sense to pull in something like TypeScript, and it's like 10, 20 lines of JavaScript and you're, you're good to go, or there's a NuGet package that already solves the problem. So uh, if you're extremely comfortable, you're a JavaScript guru, go for it, have fun in there. 
Um, I find Blazor very frustration free and uh, it, it just works. It's one of those technologies that uh, it just works and you're very efficient uh, in it. So hopefully that, that answers the question. Yeah, thank you. I, I would I would agree with that. I, I haven't used Blazor very much because I'm mostly on the back end these days. But, you know, uh, the Node developer can write JavaScript all the way up and down the full stack. And I think Blazor, <laughs> you know, maybe not 100% right now, but probably eventually, um, maybe sooner than later, uh, you'll be able to write um, C Sharp up and down the stack all the way. So that's, I would, that's what I'm I would forward to. err on the side of sooner rather than later. <laughs> if uh, let's go to demos.telerik.com. This is a... a a demo app that I wrote for progress. Um, it's called the blazer coffee warehouse. Uh, this application here, it is, let me make sure it's loading there. We've got a weird bar. I think this is the, uh, this is, uh, the live stream or something. Um, this application is written with, uh, almost no JavaScript at all. And when I mean almost no JavaScript at all, I can show you the exact spot that it's used in. So the JavaScript for this application is used to change the theme from light to dark. The only reason that this is there to change the theme from light to dark, and I am getting some sort of error there. Let's see if that goes away. Uh, I think it has something to do with some latency or something here. Okay, so it's gonna, it, it's one of those days. Anyhow, the, the toggling uh, from light to dark here is um, JavaScript is required because of the way that Blazor is structured and React and Angular do this as well. So if I, let's see, is it view page source? When I view page source on a Blazor WebAssembly application, the app tag is where the application resides. It's, it's um, DOM. Some people call it a shadow DOM. In Blazor, it's called a render tree. Uh, basically, Blazor is aware of all of the nodes that are inside of this app tag. And the CSS files are outside of that app tag. The only way to access those in the version of Blazor this was written in was to write JavaScript to go tell it that there are resources up here that it needs to uh, interact with. Um, in .NET 5, they added an API layer to do this. So I, I don't actually need that piece of JavaScript in the app anymore. Um, it was only like 10 lines of code anyway, so it wasn't a big deal, and it's still in here. Uh, other than that, there is no other JavaScript in the app. Now, the app can do things like drag and drop tiles. Uh, we can go to a sales page, and there are two views that are tied together. We can select a uh, custom date range from a date range picker, and it will um, keep these two views in sync. Uh, we can filter uh, the, the cost data in the columns and all of that sort of thing. You can see there's pop-up boxes and animated filters, all of that good stuff. Uh, we can modify columns. We can lock them. Uh, you can turn on and off columns that you don't want to see. I mean, the typical line of business stuff that you're going to do on a daily basis, it's all in here. CRUD operations. I don't know what this error is. This is just like, a, like I said, one of these, one of those days where nothing works <laughs> when you're trying to demo stuff for people. <laughs> Never seen this happen before. Uh, so we can do CRUD operations in here. We can edit records. Uh, we can select and upload files to a server. Um, all these things I can do without JavaScript. So um, it will even do um, it will even do localization and globalization. So we've completely changed our app from English to Bulgarian, and uh, again, no no JavaScript to do any of this stuff. So it's pretty impressive what you can pull off uh, with without JavaScript here. And uh, the only times you're, you're going to need JavaScript in a Blazor app are when you need to access something that is, it's a web API, or sorry, a DOM API that isn't supported by Blazor. And the things that aren't supported are things like uh, webcam access. Um, uh, like if you want to tap into like a microphone or video, um, 
it's it's very like edge case things um there there's an api for working with your usb devices uh there's geolocation but it's uh you know these aren't things that you do in a uh, business application all of the time um and then there's also nougat which is full of uh packages that you can pull in to do some of these things already so what's happening is um You've got NuGet packages that have the JavaScript files and a uh, C Sharp uh, API around them. So you're interacting with C Sharp still, and you have no clue that there's JavaScript happening underneath the surface. Uh, so there, there's a lot of things that you can do with Blazor that you're, you're going to find you just don't need JavaScript at all. So uh, you, you, you the... definitely don't need like NPM and Webpack and all of those things if you do write like five lines of JavaScript to patch something together. Sorry, let me step on you there. But uh, I want to get to the next question. Since you were showing view source there, a question came in from <laughs> Jeffrey A. Miller. Is code visible in plain text easily on the client like JavaScript would be? Um, it is not, but it doesn't mean it doesn't exist. Um, I think I know why that, that page is failing, by the way. Um, <laughs> we won't troubleshoot it in uh, <laughs> live here. But uh, I'm going to go back to it for a moment. Uh, we, we just had a release today. And I think there is a library that's outdated in here is why we keep seeing that little error pop up. Uh, let me see if I can get this to come up. And what you will see if this, if this is going to play nice for me today is in our, in our network tab here. Uh, let's see, under sources, content. Um, we should have some DLL files in here. So you, you will have DLL files that do pass across the network. Let me see if I can get those to at least show somewhere in here. Uh, we may be running server-side Blazor here, I'm not sure. On a, on a WebAssembly application, um, yeah, I think this is a server app, but you will see uh, a DLL file show up in your network traffic. Um, and this goes for any client-based uh, technology. So if I have a Xamarin app, for example, same thing applies. Uh, you have DLLs that are loaded onto the device. You can then get those DLLs and you can, uh, you can decompile those DLLs. Um, so while it's not plain text, the source code for your application is on the device. Um, so I'm not gonna you know, pretend that it, it's not there for somebody to decompile. It is a little bit more of a process, I think, than it is to just look at standard JavaScript that's come across the wire, but it's not any more secure for somebody that wants to be um, you know, a bad uh, you know, black hat and, and do something with your code. Um, if you want to protect code, you put it on the server and you leave it on the server. So you build web APIs around things and call uh, into your intellectual properties through web APIs and secure things with, with keys and whatnot. Uh, so the, the rule of thumb with, with uh, security is you never trust the client and anything that you send to the client has already been compromised. <laughs> That's just the gist of it, uh, whether you're writing JavaScript or C Sharp or some other thing. If the client has it, the client has it. You can't do anything about it once they have it. Okay, um, next question. So um, if you don't know this one, that's fine. We're talking about databases now. But the question was from MicroCompass, in disconnected mode, say a progressive web application, uh, what database do you use? I mean, maybe you don't use one, but maybe you can speak to that, what you might use in that case. Um, in a disconnected environment, what database do I use? Is that right? So I'm assuming that the... if you're on, if you're using a web browser app and you don't have internet connection, you're going to save some data to a database that gets synced later. Maybe that's okay. The idea there. Um, the I know there's a couple choices out there. I'm not too familiar with this though. Uh, there's a couple APIs built into the browser for this. Um, and there's like a local DB that you can use uh, to, to cache things local on the uh, device. There's also, I think, some, uh, 
some type of SQL database that you can use in .NET, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't imagine that to be very efficient on the browser. I think there's stuff built into the browser to, to help handle this, but I, I just don't have enough experience with it, I guess, to, to answer that too accurately. I would look into, I think it's local DB that you can leverage for that type of a, a situation. Uh, PWA apps, um, uh, that's, that's one of their uh, primary selling points is that they can do stuff offline. Um, and there's some APIs in the browser that are being standardized for that. Yep, I, the one I've heard most of is PouchDB uh, is another option there. Um, and I would say Couchbase, but we don't have one that works in a browser-based app just yet. Uh, next question. Uh, I don't know if this one makes any sense, but from Bleak Morn. So is there a Blazor, but with TypeScript? Not quite sure what that means, but maybe you could. Um, I, I think that question might be slightly misguided. Uh, so Blazor uses, uh, maybe I didn't show enough um, Blazor code, but the, the code for Blazor is all C Sharp. So there's no JavaScript here. So there there would be no TypeScript. Uh, so TypeScript compiles, if you want to call it compiles, it translates, uh, trans, transpiles to, uh, to JavaScript. Um, a Blazor application is 100% C Sharp. So there, there's no um, opportunity even for TypeScript to play a part in uh, the code for the application. Other than if you needed uh, one of those APIs, I said that's not supported by Blazor. So if you're you're working with um, like your your webcam, for example, you could write TypeScript and call it from your Blazor app, but you wouldn't write TypeScript primarily as the the main language for your app. You'd be writing C sharp. All right, another question. A little confused about um, from Smashing Proven is is the Java runtime? Maybe he means JavaScript, but he said Java runtime responsible to run the Blazor WebAssembly code? I'm guessing Java's not involved in any way. Right? Yeah. Okay. Um, I would say this is probably a question about the JavaScript runtime. So um, people like to ask this question, I think, to be like a little cheeky about the fact that uh, WebAssembly um, requires JavaScript. So this isn't like a, I want JavaScript to die type of a talk. But um, if you go to, let's see, is it webassembly.org? Uh, I think this is it, yeah. So if you go to webassembly.org, this is the organization page for WebAssembly. Um, and if you look at the facts for WebAssembly, um, they spell out in here very clearly that WebAssembly is not here to, uh, to outdo JavaScript or replace it. Um, and when you write JavaScript or when you write any WebAssembly application, here's the section here, um, there is actually a requirement by the browser. Uh, this may change in the future, but currently uh, WebAssembly is bootstrapped by uh, JavaScript. So when you load your WebAssembly into the application or into the browser, there's actually like two or three lines of JavaScript that say, take this WebAssembly code and mount it to the browser and so on and so. So there, there's some like bootstrapping mechanisms that are, are built into the browsers, like an API layer you have to go through to get your WebAssembly running. Uh, so JavaScript is needed to run WebAssembly, which uh, some people find like ironic in, in uh, it's, uh, you know, it's just part of the, the transition period that we're in, I think. Um, I think that'll go away in, in some, at some point. But the whole idea of WebAssembly is not to replace JavaScript. It's to, to give alternatives uh, to the tooling that surrounds web development. Um, so this gives us more tools instead of locking us into a single uh, tool set. Um, so I think that's probably where, where that type of question usually comes from. Okay. Um, was, you will was, see in... Oh, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, you will see in Blazor uh, as well. I mean, Blazor, uh, the .NET runtime is running in WebAssembly, but Blazor itself is using uh, some JavaScript beneath the hood that you don't see as a developer uh, to kind of patch some things together. 
So uh, like when when we're re-rendering the DOM and stuff inside of uh, C Sharp, there's actually some JavaScript code somewhere deep beneath the covers that actually interacts with the DOM because WebAssembly cannot do DOM manipulation. So there, there's a lot of these interop layers that happen. Uh, but as a .NET developer, I don't have to write the JavaScript. I'm using uh, a framework that's already there and has been written. Uh, just like when you write .NET apps, you're not writing compiler code all the time. You're writing .NET code, so you don't have to go to the bare metal and do these things. And I know we have some sort of uh, students and, and boot campers here, so uh, <laughs> I, I just want to make it clear, uh, if you're not familiar yet, Java, JavaScript, not the same thing. I uh, know that's confusing, uh, but but just want to make sure if that was the point of confusion, just want to make that clear. Not yeah, the same thing. Yeah, there's no Java here. Yeah, no no Java yep. involved at all. All right, uh, next question. This hopefully this is a quick one uh, from Jeffrey A. Miller. Link to objects that works on uh, the client. He says, I assume he means client side Blazor. Is that correct? Uh, yeah, all. Um... All .NET code that is not tied to a specific uh, UI component like uh, like Xamarin or something like that, or to a specific operating system on uh, uh, API. So anything that's generic .NET code works. So Link uh, works perfectly fine. So any I enumerable, any anything built off I enumerable works perfectly perfectly well in Blazor in the browser. Um, all of uh, C sharp nine works in the browser. Okay, another quick hit question here, Smashing Proven. And again, I think you covered this, but just want to make sure. Uh, can we use C-sharp language to code ML.net? I'm pretty sure the answer is yes. You could probably yeah, use VB um, as well if you wanted to, right? I don't know if VB is supported, really? to be honest. Okay. Um, I know that, C, that uh, um, C-sharp is like the primary way, and I think think you can write modules that are in other languages as well that are ML languages and interact with them. So I believe, and, and I may be wrong here, but I believe you can use things like Python and whatnot as um, like extension points for this. But uh, this is all just outputting metrics here, but this is, this is all .NET code that is doing um, the machine learning and uh, metrics. So you'll, you'll find only in this this whole project, there is no, um, I don't think there was any, yeah, there's no JavaScript in here. Uh, there's no Python. There's no other languages but C Sharp. Uh, as far as options for, for ML.net, though, I don't think VB is one of them. That's kind of surprising. Uh, just like assume... you can't write VB apps. Uh, you can't write Blazor VB apps. Oh, interesting. It's, it's not a, yeah. Um, when they moved from .NET uh, framework to .NET Core, some of those things got left behind, and they had uh, tentative plans to bring them into the fold. Um, I think VB made it to a certain point, but I don't think you can do Blazor um, with uh, with VB. Um, what you can do is you can write .NET standard uh, libraries with VB, and you can consume those in any of these frameworks. Uh, but you can't write them specifically. Like I, I can't go into a, a Blazor component and just start writing VB code or anything like that. Cool. Well, I learned something new. And uh, please, no VB hate in the chat. It's a perfectly fine .NET language. A lot uh, of people start a... about VB, and my, myself included. Yeah, I, they may end up doing it someday. Um, I haven't seen it yet. Uh, a couple of other questions that are kind of broad. So, I mean, if you know, you don't have to go into these too deeply if you don't want to. And there's been some chat about them. But uh, from Integer Man, my big questions on ML.net are how it compares to Azure ML or the wrappers around it in Azure Cognitive Services. So, maybe Ooh, uh, that's a, few a great on question. That. Yeah. that is a really great question. So, uh, Azure Cognitive Services, uh, there, there's kind of like this uh, three layer approach. Um, that we've got with um, with all of these. Um, let's see if I can find a, just a kind of a white space here. Uh, so with Azure um, uh, Azure Cognitive Services, uh, we kind of have like the the um, the lowest technical hurdle. So we've got uh, I need to know very little 
about uh, ML to make this work. So that's that's like the beginner level. I can go out and purchase uh, Azure machine or Azure Cognitive Services uh, time or CPU cycles or whatever it's measured in these days. Um, I think it's requests. So number of requests I can I could pay per request to do some uh, canned machine learning thing like analyze images, uh, do facial recognition, all of that stuff. All I need to know as a developer is how to send it an image and how to parse JSON data back. That's all I need to know. I don't need to know anything about machine learning. Uh, the next level on this tier, like the intermediate tier where I need to know more about machine learning um, is Azure ML, not to be conf uh, confused with uh, Azure Cognitive Services. Uh, and what Azure ML offers is it has a drag and drop um, interface, which I know that sounds scary to developers, but for the purposes of machine learning, it actually is a very nice experience. Um, you can think of it similar to like a scratch type of a, an interface uh, where you, you drag a widget onto a, a panel and then you have connectors you drag to other widgets and this tells the model how to do things. Um, the documentation on Azure ML is phenomenal. Um, it's where I learned a lot of my machine learning uh, from. Uh, it's just that documentation alone. Uh, because the widgets are laid out visually and you can click on them and get help on the individual widgets, it's a very good learning experience. You don't need to know a whole lot uh, about machine learning to make that system work. There's a lot of great examples and um, there's like a whole storefront to that thing. Uh, so that that's a little bit more, you, you know, you need to know enough uh, to be dangerous to get in there and do stuff. Um, it's also a kind of a little bit more of a closed system. So your, uh, you know, your, your opportunities to, to do creative things in there are a little bit more closed. Uh, ML.net, um, until that uh, they built that tool for Visual Studio, um, you really had to know your stuff. Uh, I struggled with it when it first came out. I still managed to build something, but it took a lot of reading through docs to make it happen. Um, with the new tool, it kind of brings it in line a little bit more with that intermediate layer. Uh, but if you need to alter the model that the wizard has built, um, you are definitely on your advanced track here. Um, and then beyond that is uh, kind of like the other, the other languages. So you've got like Python and um, uh, what, is, what is the uh, Google one? If anybody knows that one, uh, TensorFlow. Uh, those, are, those are beyond, to me anyways, those are beyond advanced. Like this is rocket science to me. I, I haven't gotten into those yet. Uh, but there, there's a nice um, onboarding now where you can get into these at various levels, which is really nice. I know you asked for like two sentences, but it's a tremendous that. answer. And I'm, you know, I just, I'm going to be respectful <laughs> of your time and that's really, really good. That's the best explanation I've, I've seen yet. So thank you for that. One yeah, more. All of these are worthy of a time investment, by the way. <laughs> yeah. um, you can do a lot of fun stuff here with Azure Cognitive Services in a very short period of time. We had a stream on the Code It Live channel last week or so, uh, February timeframe that did that uh, with Blazor. We did it very quickly. It was fun. Um, this stuff, if you're learning like this Azure ML stuff, like I said, the docs there are like the best learning experience I've had with ML. So, And uh, what was that uh, Code It Learning you just mentioned? How can I find uh, code that? Code It Live. Code It Live. Uh, on Code It Live, that's our, our work uh, Twitch channel. This is just a chance for you to plug. That's all. Yeah. It's Code It Live. If you follow our channel there, um, you'll see that we've got a bunch of videos that we did. Um, we did there, recent broadcasts. Uh, we did something in February that was called Love Week. And uh, during Love Week, I think some of the videos might be on our YouTube page now, but uh, we built a uh, facial recognition app where it would uh, show various images over a period of time and use your webcam to gauge your facial expressions 
And then it would send it all up to Azure Cognitive Services for examination, and it would send back a score that would tell you um, which, which photo made you react most positively. So that was all just something that was built very simply and easily um, versus like training a model to recognize faces and all of that would have been much harder. Okay, one more question here, and this, again, might be a tough one. So uh, f this is from Hoagsy. For the WebSocket connection, are there any good options for that weird spot where you're just big enough to need load balance, but not big enough to afford elastic resources? Um, yeah, I don't know if there's an in-between answer other than Azure, um, Azure ML or, or Azure uh, SignalR services. So Azure SignalR as a service is, uh, there's different entry points to this now. I don't know when the last time you looked at it was, but there are, um, I, I can't remember how these are categorized in, in Azure, but they're like, uh, it's like R1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. They're like different tiers of what you need. They have more tiers now than they had at the beginning. So if you haven't looked at it in like say a year, uh, there's a lot more cost um, buckets for you to put your uh, your app in. So you can start with free, which is so many uh, connections per minute or whatever it is, and then you can scale up from there. So uh, implementing Azure SignalR service is extremely, extremely easy. It's literally like two lines of code. Like, I'm not joking. It's literally two lines of code. So if you wanted to, you know, try it, and see what your, your bill is going to end up being. I mean, you could turn this on and test it for a month or two and see what it's going to cost you. Um, and if you're not happy with it, you can take those two lines of code out and then your app goes back to normal. It's really that simple to configure. Um, what it does is it, it creates a proxy and it redirects all of your WebSocket traffic from your app to the cloud. Um, and it has its own backplane. So, you don't have to worry about anything. And for uh, the cost of whatever SignalR as a service is versus creating your own backplane, I think you're probably going to end up coming out ahead. That's my, my opinion. All right. So that's all the questions I've written down, and nothing's really come in since then. So I, I know we're running up on time here. So please, everybody, I want you to throw some emotes there in the chat. Give Ed a, a Twitch round of applause. They'll all appear up on the screen there. Uh, thank you very much. That was a great presentation. Uh, really appreciate that. And I'm going to make your face bigger now because we're going to switch over to the uh, prize giveaway. All right. So keep those emotes coming, everybody. Appreciate that. So you don't need the screen share anymore, right? Uh, I don't, no. Okay, cool. Unless you, unless you want to show. Whoops. Okay. All right, so uh, as I said at the beginning, we've got two prizes to give away. First place prize is a uh, free license for any JetBrains product. And uh, second place prize is some Couchbase swag that I will send to your address if you are in the United States. So what I've got here on the screen is what we call Synergy. So this is actually JetBrains uh, data grip program. It allows you to connect to lots of different types of databases. This is a great uh, choice, by the way. I use DataGrip all the time. But you can also get ReSharper or Rider or any of the other great stuff, WebStorm, things like that from JetBrains. And what I've got running here is a query that will actually, uh, I can SQL query against Couchbase. And I'm, uh, all your messages that you've been throwing into the chat are actually stored. So you can see some of the most recent messages coming in. And so what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to copy and paste another query over here that will pick uh, from all those people who have chatted uh, at random. And I'm excluding this time, I've modified this query to exclude some of the organizers who will normally uh, waive their, their prize winner. So hopefully that will make this a little more streamlined this time. Um, but okay, so we're going to draw for the first place prize first, which is the JetBrains license. You need to be present to win. So if you are the winner, please say in the chat, hey, that's me. Uh, and then uh, you'll need to just whisper to me or email me your uh, email address, and I will get this uh, prize emailed to you uh, later on this week. All right? So 
Drum roll, please. First winner of the Jet Brains license is Jones Joseph. Jones Joseph, are you still around? Jones Joseph. Let me zoom in on here so you can see your name and lights. Jones Joseph. JetBrains works well with Blazor as well. Yeah, sure. You yeah, can use, the, uh, the IDE works fantastic. Uh, you can use Writer or JetBrains mm -hmm. or, uh, sorry, ReSharper, I assume. Anything yeah, and, and Jones Ryder Joseph? As well. Oh, this, yes, you're here. Jones Joseph. Okay, congratulations, Jones. You're Jones and for a license. I need you to email me at mgroves.com. I'll put that here in comments. Me at mgroves.com. And I will zoom in on this. Whoops. Uh, and I will zoom in on this. There you go. Me at mgroves.com. Uh, please email me there. So I'll just have your email address. That's all I need. I'll put it in the chat as well. Okay. Second place prize winner. You must be in the United States to collect this because I'll be shipping a package to you with, in case you weren't around at the beginning, this fancy couch base uh, cooler bag. You can put all your drinks or soup or whatever you want in there for your picnic. It'll keep it cool or warm. And I'll throw some stickers and whatever swag I can find in there with it. All right. And I'm going to add jones joseph to the list here so he doesn't get picked again all right <laughs> all right so drum roll please second place prize is coil twitch bot <laughs> i don't know if i want to give a prize away to a bot but coil twitch bot are you still around and yes definitely check out telerik.com uh see all the cool stuff they're up to there and it's not just blazer they've got a lot of amazing stuff there at telerik so definitely check that out but coil twitch bot are you actually a bot if not are you still around? Say something, please, so we can get this raffle closed up. Going once for Coil Twitch Bot. Going twice for Coil Twitch Bot. All right. Sorry, Coil Twitch Bot, you missed out. We're going to draw again. And yes, here we go. Drum roll. And... Happy Problem Solver. Well, that's quite a name. Happy Problem Solver. Are you still around? Happy Problem Solver. You are the winner of a bunch of Couch Base swag if you are still around. Happy Problem Solver. And if you live in the United States. That's you. Okay. Yay, Excellent. Sarah. All right. So, he or she is there. yes, Happy <laughs> Problem Solver. Make sure to email me with your home at well, wherever you want to ship to, I guess. It doesn't have to be your home address, but your address, physical address you want to ship to, please email me there, or you can whisper to me on Twitch. That's fine, too. All right, congratulations, everybody. Any last questions for Ed before we let him go? And uh, I will say some parting words. Oh, uh, th this project I worked on was to learn, like, all the things, right? Uh, never stop like learning new stuff just go out there and try to you know anything that looks interesting try to learn it um i'm doing some streams uh next it was supposed to start this week but the the server <laughs> crashed uh but I, i'm starting to do some vr development now um and i'm learning dotnet 6 so there, there's just tons of stuff out there to learn uh take take a few minutes to break off a little project like this and work on it it's a lot of fun and you'll you'll find places to apply all this stuff and uh it, it'll do wonders for your career well said ed thank you very much for being on and uh we'll let you go now thank you very much yeah in, in your man's right on it, it so uh long story short <laughs> I, I meant to kick off a new vr stream today and uh the vr platform is in the cloud and that cloud was broken it was offline so the the entire stream was me going why isn't this working? Why is it? What's going on? <laughs> clouds. Yeah, well, leaky. They're yeah. leaky clouds. I, th I think despite some of the things you ran into, it was, it was, everything worked fine and a really, really great presentation. You covered a lot of different stuff that the people in this group have been asking for uh, for awesome. months. So really appreciate it. Yes, tremendous is the word to describe it. Thank you very much. Oh, I don't know that. That word's tainted <laughs> these days. <laughs> oh, we'll go there. Uh, all right. Thank you so much, everybody. I, I love the questions, by the way. Um, I do a lot of these uh, type of sessions, and a lot of times you finish, and you're like, anybody got any questions? And the tumbleweeds roll, and the crickets chirp, and uh, you wonder if you've, you're, you've done the right thing. So getting a lot of questions, being able to uh, 
uh, answer those is uh, very helpful to me as well. Yeah, and uh, make sure to keep an eye on Twitter, Facebook, Meetup, uh to see what we're, who we're going to have for March, uh, March presentation. So look forward to that. And again, uh, also, if you have a chance, uh, please go and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Smash that subscribe button, as the kids say. And that way we can get ourselves a real URL. So we would appreciate that. <laughs> uh, and that's all we have for today. So thank you very much, everybody, for joining. Great discussion, great questions. And uh, that's it. We'll see you next month. Awesome. Thanks a lot.